Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brittany Bodane, and I'm excited to be here today to show you five ways to refine your grids by assigning no data. Today, we'll cover how to assign no data in the grid data dialog. Um, we'll show, you'll see how to use one or more polygon boundaries. We'll discuss how to assign no data in the grid data dialog using a convex hull or an alpha shape. We'll also discuss assigning no data using the grid from contours dialog, as well as how to assign no data on an existing grid and replace the, um, and replace a certain part of a grid with another grid. After the discussion of each topic, I'll start. For, I'll stop for a few minutes to go over any questions. You can send your questions in via the webinar host or on the QA panel, and that's located on the Zoom toolbar. Type in your question, and it will be sent to the webinar host, who will either answer it or forward it to me. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. This just allows uh, me and the host to keep everything organized and make sure we don't miss any of your questions. Feel free to send in all of your questions. If we don't have time to answer them during the webinar, we'll answer them via email once the webinar is completed. And this webinar is being recorded. Later this week, we'll post a webinar recording along with the data used, and I'll send each of you a link when it's posted so you can test out these examples yourself. So let's get started by first just talking about what assigning no data is and a few examples of why you might want to do this. As many of you have probably found, Surfer will automatically grid data into a square extent unless otherwise specified. Assigning no data is how we can tell Surfer to leave some of these data nodes um, uninterpolated. Some reasons you might want to, you might want an irregularly shaped grid um, that isn't just a square rectangle would be you're concerned with a specific area, um, such as maybe the outline of a county. Um, you might be interested in just the body of water, the construction pathway of a road, or uh, many other reasons. So for our first example today, we'll start out with a very simple example of assigning no data. What we can see here is a contour map that was created by gridding the data points that are shown in red. When the data was gridded, uh, there were no instructions for Surfer to um, keep the gridded data constrained to a boundary. So Surfer went ahead and filled out the whole rectangle. We'll take a look at how we can apply a no data boundary to this existing grid, um, which is actually a TIFF file, um, using just the border of this house footprint, blueprint. So the first thing to know about assigning no data is that the polygon that you're using as your border needs to be in the same coordinate space as the grid file that you're using. Surfer can have multiple layers in a map object, and they all could use different coordinate systems. Each one of these could have a different coordinate system assigned. So it's important to understand your data before you get started. Because all of these data, these layers are in this single map object, we have a, a, an inkling of the fact that we should be able to have our coordinates in the same space, but we can double check what coordinate system all of our layers are using by selecting the layer in the contents window and in the properties window, clicking the coordinate system tab. Now we don't have anything set here, which is totally fine. As long as we don't have a coordinate system set for anything else, um, we should be good. And here we can see I've clicked the rest of our layers and the coordinate system tab shows an unreferenced local system for each of them. So lastly, I'll just double check that our map object also is unreferenced. So what this tells me is that all of my data is using the same numbers for my XY coordinates. So when Surfer goes to look at my polygon boundary and my existing TIFF file, it's going to look at the numbers for the X and Y and assign no data outside of these given values. So first to assign no data, 
we'll click the grids tab in the ribbon and in the edit section I'll click assign no data. This is the option you will use if you already have a grid file, uh, like in our example here. And this tool is nice. It accepts all the same grid file formats that Surfer does. So for example, we have this TIFF. We can use a TIFF in here. You could use a grid you got from ARC. Um, it's nice if you uh, are starting with a grid file already, you don't have to convert it or anything to be able to use it in this tool. So we could browse to a file, but we have our file open. So I will just select our TIFF from this dropdown. And then I will select our no data boundary from the dropdown as well. When I load this file in, we can see that Surfer has loaded six polygons total. And seeing that, I'm thinking that that's not quite what we want. We actually just want this one main polygon. So let's take a look at what we can do. Um, we can come back in this dialog and we'll click selected objects only, but first we need to select the object. So I'll just click cancel. And we'll expand our base layer by clicking the little plus sign so we can see what we have in here. As we can see, we have a bunch of polylines and a polygon on top. If I select the polygon and I just toggle the visibility on and off or uh, even change our color so we know that that is actually the, the polygon that we're working with, we can select it leave it selected, highlighted blue, and come back up to the Assign No Data tool. And again, we'll select our open objects, but this time I'll check selected objects only, and you'll see loaded one polygon total. We'll toggle No Data Outside. Now we can go ahead and give our new grid a name. And I'm going to choose to add our grid as a layer to our existing map, as opposed to creating a brand new map. And I'll click OK to add it as a contour map. So if I expand our base layer, turn off our original contours, we can see Surfer did do exactly what we wanted. We don't have the contour map on the other side of this line anymore. And if we want to quickly apply the same color map we had to our old grid, we can do so by selecting it, clicking home in the ribbon, copy format, selecting our new layer and clicking paste format. Surfer draws the objects in the order they're listed in the contents window. So if I click and drag this contour layer down to the bottom, when my mouse turns into the black arrow, we can now see our other layers again. So really good warm up example of assigning no data, um, very simple to just have um, these very square shapes and um, to see what that does. So we'll get into a little bit more complex examples as the webinar goes on today. But before we do that, I wanted to show a couple of tips to make your map a little more publication or client ready. So for this map, we can do a few things um, such as with our contour layer selected, we can click levels in the properties and we can add a color scale to show what's going on with our map here. I like to try and fit my color scale on, especially since I have this empty space where we assign no data. Um, so we can actually select our color scale and I'm going to rotate it so it is um, horizontal instead of vertical by clicking the um, I always lose the rotate button layout tab in the ribbon and I'll click the drop down and click rotate. And I'll just do negative 90. So now we can get this to fit in the space a little bit better. And then so it's a little bit less cluttered. We can click the labels tab in the properties while the color scale is still selected and change our frequency. We can choose to show the max value 
And then we can make our font a little bigger after we shrunk the color scale itself. You can also add a title. And there's always customizations available. So we'll give our scale a title. If we click the Map Tools tab and select our map, we can also add a scale by clicking the scale bar. We'll change some features here on the scale bar to make it fit our map a little bit more. I actually only want one cycle. And I'm just going to go ahead and change this to the rail. And if I click the labels tab for the map scale and expand our label format, we have a prefix suffix field. I really like to use these. They're available for axes. Uh, we could add it to the, the color scale if we wanted to, um, but we'll just keep it simple and, and add a little M so you can tell that the distance we're looking at on this map is in meters. And then last but not least, I want to make some changes to my contour map labels. They're looking a little more cluttered than I think they need to and overlapping portions of my blueprint. So I can manually move these labels around by selecting our contour layer and the contents. And on the map tools tab in the edit layer section, I'll click contour labels. Our mouse immediately changes to this black um, kind of arrow so you can tell we have a different mode and the labels can be clicked and dragged where you'd like them you can delete by pressing delete on the keyboard you can add a contour by holding control on the keyboard and clicking This just allows us to make a little bit neater of a view. I always like to do the contour labels last, changing some of the properties that we've changed in the in the property manager for our contour layer can reset these changes. So always think of your contour labels as a final touch. And when you're done, uh, press escape or click the contour labels button again, and we can exit out of it. So that is it for our first example. Um, before we move on to our next example, do we have any questions so far? Okay, we have one question. I've tried to use this tool before, but I get the error, the entire grid was assigned no data. Why is that? Um, that is likely because um, a coordinate system issue. Um, let's say for example, your grid file is in UTM, but your um, polygon boundary file is in lat long. If you try to assign no data with those two files, then um, the, the numbers just don't line up and, and Surfer can't assign no data to them. Um, if you think about um, comparing this kind of coordinate to a lat long value, which would, you know, let's say like 36 point um, several decimals, they're just not going to overlap. Um, so that's likely what the issue is. Um, if that doesn't resolve it, feel free to reach out to our support team. We'd be happy to help you figure out what is going on there. And it looks like that's the only question we have for now. So if you have um, anything else, um, any questions, please send them in. We're happy to answer them. Um, in the meantime, we will move on to looking at using the Assign No Data tool. Um, using the mixed option. Okay, um, so for this option, 
we are looking at a contour map that's of a lake with a couple islands in it. We want to assign no data to everything outside of our shoreline while also keeping all of the data inside the island borders. So lake border would be where I'm running my mouse here. And then these islands here. So we want to assign no data inside and then outside. So we could assign no data to this file twice to assign no data outside and then to assign no data inside. Um, or we can use the mix option, which allows to do both operations at the same time. The only way to use the mix option is to have the polygon border in the BLN file format. A BLN file is a Golden Software proprietary text file that can be used to create a base map, assign no data, apply break lines or faults while gridding data. Um, when a BLN file is used to assign no data, Surfer looks for a no data flag for each polygon in the file. The flag tells Surfer whether to assign no data inside or outside of the object. A value of one will assign no data inside an object and a value of zero assigns no data outside an object. We will create our BLN file from the contour line that represents the lake edge that I called out a moment ago. As we can see, the edge is a Z level of shoreline is 2240. We will want to isolate this contour line so that we can export it and use it as our polygon boundary. So to isolate this contour, we will select the contour map in the contents and click the Levels tab in the Properties. If we change both the minimum contour and maximum contour to the line we'd like, 2240, and I turn off Fill Contours, um, you can see we have isolated it down to the main contour line we want, and we'll get a few extra polygons here, which isn't a big deal. So the next thing we'll do is to export out these contour lines. We could use the Export Contours tool, but this tool will not let us export to BLN. Um, so we can skip a step if we just cut straight to using the standard file export. The catch with file export is that Surfer will export all visible objects. So before we export, we will want to turn the visibility off of anything we don't want exported. So if I hold shift down on my keyboard while I click the top axis and the bottom axis to select them both, I can turn the visibility off for all of those at the same time. And then I also want to turn off our labels. Surfer can export with a gap where the labels are depending on the format and, uh, or for our case, it could um, think that this text we want as data points. So we're just gonna get rid of these labels and we can do that in the properties tab on, on the levels tab in the properties by unchecking show labels for the major and minor contours. So now that we have done that, we can click File, Export. We will want to export out to BLN, and I am um, going to uncheck that option. So we will name this Contours 2240. And click Save. Here we have our export options and we can just see the coordinates the file will be exported with. Um, defaults are great, so I'll click over to the BLN option. Here we have a few options to consider. Uh, we can uh, have the Z elevation added. This would be helpful if we were going to use this for a break line. We will not be needing a Z value. Um, Z, Zs are not considered in assigning no data. So we'll leave that unchecked. And then we have the option to use, to apply a no data area. This will apply our flag. We will need to edit the, our file because we are going to use mix. Some will be inside, some will be outside. So I'll leave it as inside since we'll have more polygons needing this option. Anyways, 
So I'll click OK. And now we can take a look at the BLN file we created. BLN files can be opened by as a base map. So we can add it to our existing map by clicking Map, Home, Add to Map Layer, and click Base. And we can see it's identical to the grid file we had, which is perfect. Let's also take a look at what our BLN file looks like in Surfer's worksheet so we can see a breakdown of what I was describing of the format of the BLN file. To open this file type in the worksheet, we'll click File, Open in Worksheet. So here we can see column A1 has the number of vertices for our object. Cell B1 has our no data flag. Looking at this, uh, we can kind of guess that our first object is the biggest polygon just due to the number of data points that are in this line. Um, but there's also two other ways to know. Um, one would be to know that Surfer automatically will export the objects in um, reverse order here. So we've got, um, this will be our last object. Or we can use track cursor. So if I turn on track cursor, data, tools, track cursor, and I click, we can come back to our plot and see where this red hash is and see that that is indeed part of this line. Now the next thing you'll probably notice is that these are polylines and we've been talking about polygons. We can easily combine these to create a polygon and re-export out to BLN. And first I'll go back to our worksheet and turn off track cursor. So we can work on this. So when I'm combining polylines, I like to um, change the color of the line I'm working on, just so we can see here. And we're in luck because this was a contour. Uh, it is complete. So to convert it to a polygon, all we need to do is click Features, Change, Change to Polygon. And then we could export out again to save these changes, or we can come back in and add this same coordinate as the first and last coordinate, and then up this to 1934 since we're adding an additional coordinate. Before we do that, we'll wanna get rid of these unneeded, Polyline. So if I hold shift and click, see these are all selected. We can delete them. And we'll convert these to polygons as well. So now we've limited our file to just the polygons we need. And we'll just go ahead and instead of um, editing this data file, we can exit and we'll just export one more time so we have everything that we need here. I'll do it a little bit faster this time. I'm going to save over my file and choose inside again. Now we can open up the BLN one more time. And we identified this as that 
top polygon, you'll notice the vertice count went up one. So all we need to do in order to use this file to apply mixed no data flags is to change cell B1 from a one to a zero and we can save. So I'll click grids, edit, assign no data. We'll choose our open grid. And even though our BLN file is open, we will need to browse to the file. And that's just because we have saved those blinking flags and we haven't updated the layer yet. So we'll just click browse, make sure that the most up-to-date file is selected. You'll notice when I loaded that, Surfer automatically chose mixed. And now we have loaded three polygons total, two are assigning no data inside, and one is assigning no data outside. And now we can go ahead and add our contour layer to our existing map again and click OK. So now we can see we cropped out all the unneeded data that we wanted to and just have the data from inside of our border. And I'll just go ahead and show you what it looks like filled. I'll use the copy paste format again. Um, there we go. Or I'll just choose another one. Here we go. There we are. Um, update our data values by clicking the three dots here. didn't update our data values. We'll just start again here with a blue white and reset our levels. There we go. So now we can see even more what we have here along with the edge. And for pro tips for this map for improving its look for passing along to a client or publishing, um, the first thing I notice is just the, the jagged edges on this map. Um, the other thing I notice is uh, the contours themselves are just inside the map are a little bit jagged and that has to do both of these issues have to do with our data resolution so we can change the resolution of an existing grid so that we have a smaller grid node and thus a finer less obviously jagged edge using the grid mosaic tool grid mosaic tool can be used for quite a few things um, some of them obvious and some of them less obvious. We can find this tool on the grids tab in the ribbon in the resize section and we'll click mosaic. So if I load our new grid, click open, we see we, here, we have the ability to change our spacing and number of nodes. And this will look familiar to you. Uh, if you've gridded data in Surfer, you'll see this exact same field on the last page of the grid data dialog. The spacing and the number of nodes are how the resolution is controlled. These fields are tied. So if I decrease the spacing for one direction, you'll see the number of nodes increases and vice versa. So if I update this, you'll see the spacing also changes. So we can see, actually I think I wanna go even a little bit finer with this one. Now we can take a look at how um, significantly increasing the resolution looks on our file. So this is our new grid. And when I turn off our old grid, we can see that we reduce some of the jaggedness. We can also turn back our base layer and
turn up the thickness to improve. But essentially improving the resolution can allow our contours inside to look a little bit smoother and it fills in this gap. Um, the grid, the data nodes are square, so they will always have um, some kind of texture on the outside, but increasing it severely reduces that and gives more of a high quality look to the map. Our next example will take a look at gridding data and um, assigning no data by applying a convex hull and alpha shape. But before we do that, do we have any questions? Okay, I got one question through the chat feature. Um, can, is there a built-in way to smooth the contour lines without using the mosaic tool or regridding? Um, yes, you can select the contour layer and on the general tab in the properties, you can apply smoothing. This just affects the way that the grid looks. Um, so it doesn't actually change the resolution of the grid file, whereas before we were changing the resolution of the grid file. So if you were to use that grid in another application or create a map from it later, that um, the smoothing we applied would still show, whereas this is just affecting the way it looks in the contour map. Okay, next we'll take a look at assigning data in the grid data dialog. So here we're looking at an example of a grid created from the data points shown in red. And this was just gridded using the um, standard defaults in the grid data dialog. So now we'll take a look at gridding this data again, but this time we will assign no data outside of the convex hull. So I'll click home grid data. By default, Surfer chooses Kriging, and Kriging is a good default to start with if you aren't sure what gridding method to use. Um, we do have Kriging as the default method um, since it does work fairly nicely for most data sets. Here we need to select our data set we'd like to grid. I will just browse to my file and select it and click open. Surfer auto-populated my columns with X, Y, and Z, and these are correct, but if we wanted to double check, we can click the view data button and just to see what the data looks like. Next, I'll click skip to end. There are some features in the middle of the grid data dialog that are more advanced than what we'll cover today. So I'll click skip to end just to get to the output dialog. Here we have a lot of options, including, again, controlling our resolution as we were looking at before. For this example, I will assign no data outside of the convex hull. When this option is selected, we also have the option to inflate the convex hull by a value. And uh, what these two fields are going to do for us is um, the best way to imagine Assigning no data outside of a convex hull is to imagine your data points nailed halfway into a wooden board. If you stretched a rubber band around those data points, um, that would be what the convex hull would look like. If we inflated the convex hull by a value, say 10, um, that would inflate the boundary of our hull. So imagine that rubber band again, out 10 data units. And this value is always going to be in your data units. So um, I know that this is UTM, uh, so it'd be meters. Um, we'll leave it at zero so we can really see the true um, work of the convex hull. I will choose to increase our spacing. Um, I think I forgot to mention that this spacing field is always in your data units too. So if we're working in meters, what this means is that between each individual grid node in our grid, there is 126 meters between, which is pretty high. So I'm just gonna just turn it down to, I'll just say um, 70. 
and surfer auto adjusts these numbers because we can't have half of a grid, but you can have a portion of a meter. So that we've increased our resolution just a little bit to uh, make our edges fill in a little bit better. Our grid will be added as to our existing map and I'll click finish. So here we can see in the black and white grid or new grid. And again, if you were to picture that rubber band, that's exactly what Surfer has done. And you can really see it hasn't affected the interpolation. If I copy our format and paste it onto our new grid, you can't even tell that they're both on because it really has just cropped off the edges. So that's using the convex hole. The next thing I'll show you is also in the grid data dialog. So I'll bring that up again by clicking home, grid data, grid data. And we're going to use all the same settings, same data file. Skip to the end again. But this time, well, let's do this before I forget. So we have all the same settings. But this time we will choose to assign no data outside of an alpha shape. If you have your surfer open right now and you're wondering why you don't see this alpha shape value, um, that is because this is currently only in beta, but we are gearing up for a surfer release in um, about a month. So stay tuned and um, get ready to use some new features. I just couldn't resist not having this in here while doing a no data webinar. So the alpha shape Um, can be added to a base map layer, or you can use an alpha value directly in the grid data dialog or the grid from contours dialog. Um, it is applied when gridding, so you will not find it in the assigned no data dialog. An alpha shape is a polygon boundary around a set of selected data points. Um, for this particular instance, when we're creating a grid, it is selecting all of the data points in the file that we've loaded. The alpha shape allows you to control the tightness of the polygon boundary around the set of points. The larger an alpha value is, the more convex the polygon around the points will be, and the smaller it is, the more concave the polygon around the points will be. So we can take a look at this by I'm going to adjust this value. This default value right now is on the larger side of the alpha shape, it's going to produce about the same as the convex hull. Um, the, um, the convex hull is about as large as the alpha shape can go. So I'm going to reduce this by about half and enter in 2000. We're going to give our grid a new name. And we'll add our new grid as a contour map to our existing map. And I'll click Finish. So here we can see where can, we can easily compare the colored convex hole compared to the, con, the alpha shape we've created, which is more of a concave shape in the grayscale. And um, as you can see, it's much different. It cuts in on the sides, whereas that rubber band effect of a convex hole um, is just cutting straight across here. And it created a big hole in the middle where we don't have any data points at all. So it's pretty, it's pretty nifty. A lot of people have been asking for this feature for a, uh, for a little while. So we're really happy to get this in there for you. I'm sure many of you can think of um, grids you'd like to apply this to right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you about the alpha shape is if you're wondering how you would know what alpha value to use just off the top of your head, and it seems like it'd be a lot of work to just kind of grid your data, see what it looks like, try again. Um, for you, I would recommend starting out by creating an alpha shape um, with your data points in a base um, from data layer. So go ahead, add your data points using home, new map, base, based from data, and this will allow you to 
select some points or all of your points if you're going to be gridding data with it. And I just held shift while I clicked the first and last, last point. Um, then on features, new features, alpha shape. So this is nice. You could choose the whole layer in here or you could select the points as we did. And here you can see this is the default value it gave us in the grid data dialog as well. If we click preview, you can see that that's pretty much the same exact shape as the convex hole. So you can more easily try out different shapes to get the shape you are expecting from your data. Um, like 1500, I think, is a pretty good shrink fit for the data. Um, and it's fitting it much more differently than our, um, our value of 2000. And the default in this window when you press enter is to show the preview rather than OK, which I think was very smart of them to do for us here. If you're like me and like to click as little as possible. But here you can see this alpha shape is um, really helpful for you determining what value works best for your data. You could keep it as a shape and then, of course, load this into the grid data dialog as a polygon boundary or save it, apply it to an existing grid um, by keeping it in a base layer. So for instance, if we click OK, we have the option to choose which layer to add it to. We could create a new map, a new layer, or I could just simply add it to the data file I'm working with. I'll click OK. And now we have the shape in here. Um, so send in any questions about, about what you might have about the alpha shape, using it in a base map, or assign node data. Um, I have one more example to get to, which is showing how to replace a portion of a grid with another grid. So I'm just going to go into that so we don't run out of time. But please send your questions in. I'll answer everything at the end. So our last example, we will take a look at um, merging these two grids. The grid on the left, of course, has some beautiful terrain data surrounding the lake, but it doesn't have any data for the lake. And the data on the right is the data we would like to have for the bathymetry of the lake surrounded by um, obviously not correct terrain data for the area. So what we'll need to do for this file is to cut the edge of the lake here by assigning no data. And then we will insert what is left of this grid file into this one. So we have a lake boundary for our, our lake. So I'll go ahead and just add it as a layer so we can see it before we assign no data with it. I'll add it as a layer by selecting the map and clicking home, add to map, layer, base. And um, because it's a 3D surface, the object gets a little bit blended. So it's a little bit hard to see, but I, when I bump it up, you can see the borders in there plus some extra data. And then just so we can see this a little bit better, we'll use trackball on the map tools tab to adjust our perspective. I also want to add the boundary to this area so we can see how these grids uh, will fit together exactly. The fastest way for me to do that is to select the layer I want to add again and click duplicate. And then I am just going to click and drag it up. And now we can see the object has been added. to this surface. So we can see that it will fit in here quite nicely. And we can see the areas that we'll keep and what we won't keep. The next thing we'll want to do is we can see, especially if I update this color, we can see that there's a lot of additional information in this shape file other than this polygon. So I'm just going to turn off trackball and click features. 
sorry, uh, map tools, layer tools break apart, just to break apart our layer here. Working with a uh, 3D surface can be a little challenging for selecting objects. And so I'm just gonna pop it out on its own. It kept the exact same weird perspective I put this in when I was using trackball. So that's why it's looking kind of skewed here, just like this surface, but that's fine. All we really want here is to just select our polygon. We'll toggle it on and off so we can see. And then we can go ahead and assign node data. Actually, our, la our layers are the same, so I'm gonna update the name on one, which will make our lives easier. So now to assign node data, I'll click home, sorry, grids, edit, assign node data. We will select our Tahoe elevation grid. That's our grid that's on the right side. And we want our Tahoe Lake Boundary 2 shape file, selected objects only. And we'll name our grid file, and we're just going to open up a new map this time. And we can choose what kind, so I'll do a 3D surface, and I'll click OK. So here we are, we can see now how this will fit in here. So we can easily replace all of these values with the grid mosaic tool. Grid mosaic tool, again, is found on the grids resize and mosaic. Here we can select our no data grid and our Tahoe terrain grids. I'm just holding control just to make sure I'm selecting uh, the grids that I need. And I'll click open. And now in Grid Mosaic, we can see in the Grid Extents area, um, the red grid, the red is one grid and the black is the other grid. So we can see how they are lining up using their coordinates. Next, we will want to change our overlap method. And what this tells Surfer is that if there are two coordinates that have the same X, Y's, which data value to use? So we have first, last, maximum, minimum, sum, and we're gonna to wanna to use the first or last option. This option depends on the order that the grids were placed into this dialog. So if we expand out our grid file name, we can see here that the terrain file is first and the Tahoe node data is last. So if we change our overlap method to last, that means Surfer will keep the last data file it comes to, which means the Tahoe no data grid. We'll name our grid file. And again, we can create a new map with it. And I'll click OK. So now we can see our new grid. Let me turn off these other data files. And it has been nicely combined. If I right click over this, one of the many ways to get to the 3D view. And here in the 3D view, we can see that the grids were combined. They are seamlessly combined now. And if we turn the vertical exaggeration down a little bit to match what we had in the 2D plot view, um, we can really easily see our results. So assigning node data has, has many purposes, um, just mostly cutting out part of your grid so you can use it for something else, whether that's replacing parts of another grid, just getting rid of unwanted data, or from keeping Surfer from extrapolating further than your data points would normally allow for. So those were all my examples for today. Um, if you have any questions, um, please send them over. And since I skipped the last question se session, I'll uh, give everyone a moment here.
Um, could you assign no data using a buffer is a question we've received. Um, yes, buffers, you can add a buffer with Surfer. Let me find a good example for you. Um, so buffers can be added by selecting data points and clicking features, buffer. So we could create these buffer distance. It's always going to be your data units. Um, ours are uh, very small concentrations. So we could do uh, maybe I'll just leave this out of one. Then we have the option to combine overlapping buffers. So we can do that. And then all we need to do is select this polygon and use it to assign no data. Surfer would cut everything out outside of the circles. So yes, you can definitely use um, apply buffers, use them to assign no data. They are considered polygons. Um, we had one question about um, Surfer Beta in general. Um, Surfer Beta is available to those with active software maintenance. Um, so if you are the kind of person who um, wants to get your hands on some new features before they're uh, fully released, Beta is for you. Um, or you might find yourself just a person who asked for a new feature and it's in beta and not the major release yet, so you want to use it. Um, either way, we've got a lot of fun stuff in here that will be in the major release for you all soon. Um, so if um, I'm not seeing any more questions, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, please send that in. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining. I hope everyone learned at least one tidbit to apply to their workflows. Um, otherwise, this is recorded as usual, and I'll be sending a link to each of you. Um, it'll have the recording and it'll have the data that I use so you can follow along at your own pace or send it off to a friend. Um, we'll hang out for a little bit, so let us know if you have any questions. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to us at surfersupport at goldensoftware.com. Um, thanks again and have a great day.